can't see for the kids. <laughs> also, in regards to regards to disciple Bible study uh, class tonight, and class Tuesday night as well. Okay, disciple.
and from the time of God's children. Pretty you were on the outside. If you were a mean person, you were pretty. That's what she meant. 
<laughs> okay, and the last one is actions speak louder than words. Yes, don't be mean, don't bully. She means that you can say you're a good person or you can say you're a Christian, but if you don't act nice when you're out of church, then it doesn't mean anything. So now let's say a real prayer, okay? We bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, remind us that our outward appearance is not what is important, but what is in our hearts is. Help us to discover what our special gift is. Give us the courage to use our gift in your honor. And thank you for making each one of us special. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
been a while now. I know it's a freak accident, but it's a certainly serious. Keep uh, Brian in prayer and Jill, and she has some, some health concerns at this point, too. When we'll, uh, we'll bring a mic to you, uh, anyone, just uh, raise your hand. I'd like to ask you to continue to pray for Andrew Fraser. He is um, Tata and Kelly Griffith's son-in-law who had a pulmonary artery embolism this week. He's very young. Um, he is home. But, um, it's just, you know, he has to watch for the next few weeks and just pray that the embolism goes away and that the meds do what they have to do. But they all need your prayers. Are there others this morning? Yeah, I'd like to have a prayer for the, for the PDA family. He passed away, excuse me, Friday, and his service Day at 2 o'clock in the morning. Who's that? Keith, Yeager, Yeager, from the Gordon area, and Yeager family. Thank you. And me. Uh, Nell and I uh, appreciate all the prayers and good wishes we've had uh, through our problems. Uh, also, I'd like to ask if you offer a prayer for my sister in law, Mary Sue, who's in Charleston, uh, uh, assisted care facility. Thank you. Andy, it's good to have you back with us, too. Yes. It's been a while. We've been through a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, Jim Bob, that reminds me. Keep Jim Bob Brown in prayers as well. Jim Bob has had some health concerns lately and has been keeping him away, too. Are there others? Hey, Rick. Uh, my neighbor, Jerry Hager, he fell the other night. Fell over five or three his head on concrete he was unconscious there for a few minutes so they took him over to uh, general he was in ICU for a little while but uh, rumor has it he'll get to come home today or tomorrow it's thank you okay are there others Rick uh, please keep Bonnie in your prayers she'll be having back surgery on Friday this week Bonnie Friday Please continue to pray for my friend in Charleston, Brenda Craig Ellis. Thank you. Please continue to pray for one another and our church. Keep um, all of all of our church in prayers and God will continue to be with us, working with us. Um, a lot of our concerns and, and again for each other. Pray God's grace will prevail. Are there other concerns? Yes, please. Um, I'd like for some of the people in here may have who I'm talking about. My wife's uncle, Rodney Steve, is in the final days of uh, cancer and uh, uh, probably won't live through another week. So please keep the Rodney Steve's family in prayer. Right. Right. Rick, yes. Rick, about Rick Miles. We need to pray for him. Are there others this morning? By show of hands, unspoken requests, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Here we are once again, O oh Lord, in need of your grace and your mercy, in need of your healing power, in need of your comfort and your guidance. Each and every moment, Lord, of our lives, we are reminded, Lord, that we need to keep our eyes upon you and continue to trust you, Lord, for all of our needs. And each and every moment, Lord, of our journey, we are reminded more and more of our need for each other. As we come here today to worship, Lord, we often acknowledge that we worship you, and we lift up our voices and our hearts to you, even while there are tears. And we do so today. Our hearts.
worse and they hurting. They continue to hurt. One of the hours, more than one of the hours, is in great need. We lift Sonny up to you now. As he is there in an ICU room, may you be right there in his midst as we trust that you are. May you work within his body to let healing come. And may Sonny, even in this very moment, know you closer than ever before. And Lord, hold his family close. Lord, and just strengthen them and give them the grace for this very hour. We pray not only for Sonny, but for Brian and Jill. And we pray, God, that the surgery, Lord, that is to come will be effective. And God and Brian be able to just experience the evening that will come through this. We pray for Andrew this morning and his needs and the Yeager family. God, comfort them. We pray for Nelda and Andy for continued healing. We pray to the Lord for the healing that is taking place already. We lift up Mary Sue and Jim Bob. In your mercy, Lord, hear and receive our prayers. We lift up Jerry and Bonnie and Deb and Brenda, Rodney and Rick. Lord, each one of those were is special to you. And our needs, Lord, are more than just that. God, we know the love that you have for each and every one of them. May they sense that love even now. For all of us here this morning, may you be the strength that we need today. God, to get us not only through the hour, but Lord, and the days to come. May you continue to be present with us, Lord, walking with us through everything we go through. And Lord, through it all, Lord, may we be willing to always give you praise and glory. For God, you remind us so many times that you have not left us, but you are still an ever-present force that is there with us. Help us, Lord, this morning get a glimpse of your glory that, Lord, we may sing even after we've long gone to hear the service this morning. May the song Majesty still be upon our lips and in our hearts as we go away rejoicing in the fact that we have indeed met with our risen Savior here and now in this place. And again, Lord, as a people of faith, we pray together that prayer you taught us long ago. Our Father, our Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The usher is pleased. <coughs>
singing of page 327, Crown Hill with Many Friends.
happen on the top of mountains. And Henry read for us today about a mountain top experience. The, remember from reading scriptures, the, you'll know that the Ark of Noah, the no, Ark that Noah built, uh, rested when it came down to it, rested on top of a mountain. Abraham took his son Isaac up to a mountaintop to offer him unto God. That mountain was Mount Moriah. Moses saw a burning bush, you may remember, from which he heard the voice of God from a mountain called Horeb. Moses then on the top of a mountain called Sinai received the law. The Ten Commandments were given from this mountain. From the Mount of Olivet, Jesus ascended back to heaven to be with his Father after the resurrection. And of course, we refer to the place where Jesus was crucified as Mount Calvary. Those are just a few instances of mountaintop happenings or experiences in Scripture. And in our Scripture that we read this morning, the scene is, surprise, a mountain. A mountain. The name of the mountain is Hermon, or Tabor. While in Israel, we got to see this mountain as it was pointed out to us. At least Nancy and Bill and I hope your tour guide was good enough to show you. I have discovered these folks are going to have to go. John, these folks are going to have to go back to Israel because they had a, the wrong tour guide. Um, we saw all kinds of things. I talked to them about what they saw. And they're like, we didn't see that. <laughs> but I, we saw the mountain. It sort of sits off to itself even. Just a lone mountain sitting in northern Israel near the Sea of Galilee area. Jesus also, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, you know, in, in this scene, in, the, in their Gospels, Jesus goes up to this mountain with three of his disciples. You remember them, Peter, James, and John. And for some reason, through Scripture, Jesus often took this trio with him, apart from the other disciples. To, uh, we, we know that when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he took the same trio and left the others behind. But he takes these guys to the mountain with him. Over the past three weeks, uh, we have been... Um, looking at the time when Jesus went to a mountainside, the side of a mountain, in order to teach. Now the Gospel of Luke, Luke has Jesus going to a plain, on a plain area, not a mountain, but Matthew has everything happening on a mountain. And we call that teaching, if you recall, the Sermon on the Mount. That sermon, or that teaching, gives us several very good practical lessons things to live by. It's from that Sermon on the Mount, that teaching where we get the, the golden rule, for instance. We treat others as you would have them to treat you. We find that teaching there, along with other lessons. But in today's passage, there is really not one thing, I don't think, that we can identify as being practical. There is absolutely nothing practical to be found in today's passage. In fact, it's difficult to explain. Maybe it's safe to say in today's passage, passage of Scripture, we hate to say it about Scripture, but I think we can with today's. In today's Scripture, things get weird. Right? It's a weird experience that takes place on this mountain in our passage this morning. We call it transfiguration. One of those long words in the Bible. The transfiguration of our Lord. On the Christian calendar, you may know that Lent is very near when we arrive at Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday then gives way to uh, the first Sunday in Lent. But today we go along with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus to this mountain. And along with them, we experience something again that we just have difficulty explaining. 
The Bible is like that. You may know that. Um, if you haven't noticed that, maybe you will. You, you can't just read the Bible. I want you to know that. You cannot just read the Bible. And I know we are told constantly, read your Bible, say your prayers. But I have found, again, you just can't do that. The Bible isn't designed that way. The Bible isn't designed for me or you to simply read it. I've heard a lot through the years of folks who could memorize Scripture. Making a big deal about memorizing and how many passages and verses they could remember and quote for you word for word. I went to, with, to seminary with a fellow who bragged about being a walking, talking Bible. And he could quote you scripture after scripture. In fact, all you had to do was name off a scripture or a verse and he would quote it for you. Very proud of that. Everyone bragged on him and so forth. Well, I got into some trouble. You know, I hear today he's in banking somewhere down in Georgia. The Bible isn't simply to be quoted. It pulls us into the story. The Bible is designed to do that. To pull us into what is happening in Scripture. When Jesus is there on that mountainside teaching, when I read that, it's almost as though I'm right there on the mountainside with Jesus, watching Jesus, hearing Jesus teach, looking around at the faces of the disciples, wondering what's going through their minds as they hear what Jesus is saying, as they hear what I hear. Sometimes I do that while preaching, wonder what's going through their minds. And sometimes I may not want to know. <laughs> but I'm there watching the slaves do that. When Abraham is there on Mount Moriah, as a reader, I am right there with him as he prepares to sacrifice his son Isaac. And I'm watching, not just reading, watching as he gathers the sticks. I'm listening or watching further as he ties Isaac down. And I'm wondering what really must be going through his mind. I know what we're told, but I am wondering what is really happening here. What is he thinking? How is he really feeling about this as he is waiting for God to do something? And I'm listening to the conversation between father and son as I'm looking closely and noticing the sun glistening on the side of the blade that Abraham has read. And I'm left wondering, not reading, but wondering what is happening here. I'm there at the party that Perry throws. You may remember that story. I'm watching there as the stepdaughter comes out dancing as though she were dancing for the Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> and I hear Eric proclaim, anything you want, I will give it. Just ask, oh, I'll give you anything. And I'm there listening as she looks at him and says, the head of John the Baptist. I want the head of John the Baptist. I'm there. And, and you're there when we read Scripture. I'm there when Jesus goes to the garden called Gethsemane. And I behold its beauty. And it is, even today, a beautiful place. There are olive trees there. There are fruit trees bearing their fruit all year round. It's beautiful. And I watch as the same three, Peter, James, and John, fall asleep. And then I watch as Jesus falls to the ground, asking, begging, praying, if, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And I'm wondering, how painful it must be for Jesus to be in that moment because being there, I'm find, finding it difficult for me to be there. 
I'm not just reading the Bible. The Bible pulls me in to what is happening there. And I'm there when the disciples scatter. When they make a break for it. When they run. I am there when Jesus carries his cross to Calvary. And I'm there and I hear him cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I hear the sound as I listen carefully to his breath leave him. I am there and you are there. Not just reading the story, but there. And I'm there with Jesus in this passage today. And what a sight it is. Jesus is right there and all of a sudden something happens. The writer tells us that Jesus' face shone as if it were the sun. Do you imagine that? His clothes changed and became so white, the only way the author can explain or describe how white his clothes were, they all they could say were, they were like light, like light shining. The only way they could describe it. Like the author, the writer of Revelation, the only way he could describe all the sights and the sounds were through lights and, and through natural phenomena and so forth in order to describe God. The only way they could do this. I think what has happened here was in this story, how can you explain what happened there except to say heaven happened. Heaven happened. Heaven came down to earth in this passage. Even if but for a brief moment, earth caught a glimpse of heaven. And then there was Jesus standing there with Moses and Elijah. Both of them have been gone for a very long time. Both of them significant in the story of Israel. And we're told that there they are. There they are, sitting around talking with Jesus. As I'm there, I can't help but agree with Peter. When Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Basically say, it's good for us to stay here. Who wouldn't want to stay in such a moment as that? And, but then, as they're leaving the mountain sometime later, Jesus instructs these same three, after all of that, after all that they just witnessed, he says, shh, don't tell anybody. It's kind of like getting the call from the district superintendent, or in my case, the bishop. Uh, and they tell you all this good stuff, that, and exciting stuff, and what's going to be happening in your life coming up, and all this, then they say, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> you can't tell anybody until, and Jesus says you can't tell anybody until there'll be a time to say it, advertise it to the world, but for now, shh, lips tight, what happens here stays here. But the question is, I understand why we are told to keep tight lips on appointments. Now why did Jesus say to them, keep it quiet, keep it a secret? After all that wonderful, wouldn't it have been wonderful to go and announce it to the whole world? It would have changed the world, I would think. It's life changing. Now look, can you imagine these guys coming off the mountain, racing down to see who could be there first and who, was, who could be first to tell it? Uh, Peter would probably be the very first one. Even if he got there last, he'd yell, Hey! That would be Peter. Who would believe him? Who would believe him? Can you imagine them going up to Thomas and telling Thomas such an account? I could just hear Thomas, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I'm going to believe that. You know what it's like. Something big, major happens in your life and you have a hard enough time trying to figure it out yourself. Much less telling somebody else about it and getting them to believe it. 
The other day, I was asked to share my call story. By the story of how I was called to preach. And I wanted to say to this person, I'd love to tell you. But you wouldn't believe me if I told you. So I spared the person the details. And then I realized later on that what was left when I got done was just a generic story. One that made sense. Easy to understand. One that was easy for folks to accept. Much different from the events that actually happened in the late summer of 1988. I wonder what Peter, James, and John said once they got off of the mountain. I wonder too why Jesus told them not to tell. Maybe it was really because, at least for that moment in time, the events that happened were intended for the benefit of four persons. Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Have you been there when you have needed a glimpse from heaven? Just a reminder that God is in fact still with you? You've been there, I'm sure. Sometimes we get so caught up in earthly affairs, get caught up in life, that we get our eyes off of heaven. We get bogged down by all the things that we are faced with in life. Sometimes it's difficult to feel God's presence with us, or to hear and be reminded of God's promises to us, and to see those glimpses that God is trying to get us to take notice of. Those glimpses, folks, can be just what we need for the very moment. They may not come often, but when they do, they're enough for us to carry on. They give us enough. That may be why we come to church. We come here hoping, maybe, just maybe, whether it's through the singing of the hymns or the reading of the scripture or through prayer time or in fellowship time or hearing the sermon, whenever it may be, we get a glimpse right here in this place of what it is God is going to show us that would be enough at that very moment to help us leave here and go forth into life, pressing onward being those people whom God has called us to be. And if I tell you, who will believe it? Sometimes God still comes to our world just for us, just for you, and we're for me, and not for the whole world. But He comes in our moment. And when heaven is rolled back, God allows us to see just a glimpse. Transfiguration can't be explained. Go to somebody out on the street, how is your transfiguration someday? Well, okay, um, I, I don't know. I guess. Uh, you can't explain it, but it's not meant to be, yet it is that what happens in that very moment, that critical moment, transfiguration, this moment in our passage, is that critical moment in the life of Jesus. Because when he goes off that mountain, he's making his way to Jerusalem. It's that critical juncture in life when God does something or shows us something to say, hey, don't forget, I am here with you. I have not left you, and I will, therefore, be with you the rest of the way. Timmy was born with special needs, severe special needs. When he was six years old, his father gave up and left never to be seen or heard from ever again. Leaving Timmy with his mother to raise him, to 
provide for him. Everything Timmy would get, his mother would give for, for Timmy. The mother loved Timmy, and she cared for him and sacrificed everything she had for the sake of Timmy. When Timmy was 19 years old, he had already lived longer, much longer than anyone ever anticipated Timmy lived. Without the funeral, his mother was approached and asked, How did you do it? How could how, how did how could how did you do it all along? I admire you. I don't know if I could have done it. But all those things were said. How did you do it? And the mother spoke up and said, Well, you see, I, I did not have to do it alone. I did not have to do it alone. You see, there were those times where it got very difficult. I did not know how I would continue. And there was one of those days when Timmy was about seven years old, yet he was acting like he was two. And I had enough. I picked Timmy up and I took him in the living room. I was trying to do the dishes. I sat him there in the front of the big picture window. And I said, Timmy, the trash folks are about to come along any time and they'll be picking up the trash. You sit right here and you watch. Don't move the spot. Watch as they come. Just sit there. And she went in and was continuing to do what she was doing, saying a few things under her breath. And then all of a sudden, something in the living room got her attention. And it caused her to turn and look and and she went a little further, and she got a little further, where she could see Timmy sitting there in awe of the trash truck. And as they were dumping the trash, and he was just smiling and looking and observing in awe. But she said, but that wasn't all. She said, there Timmy said, watching this scene as a beam of light shine through the pain glass with it, right down on my Timmy, like a spotlight. And she said, in that very moment, I realized I saw God, or I saw my son. In that moment, I saw my son in the same way God sees my son. And it was enough. It was enough to carry on. Those glimpses that we get from heaven aren't glimpses that we take or that we find. They are gifts that God gives to us. And I have discovered that sometimes they don't come when I think they should or I want them. But they always come in God's time. It's always when I need it. May God bless you as we wait for those moments to come in our life, knowing that God gives us what we need and when we need it. Let us stand now and sing. Now, what is the right one? Oh, okay. I know what I did while ago. I skipped the last one. Now we're going to sing. Page 327, Crown Hill of Faithful.
you for serving as our acolyte and drum as well. You and have double duty this morning. Yeah, yes, you do. You have any parting words of wisdom for us? Uh, All the time. <laughs> Thank you.